Hello! <laughs> Chapter 13, Song of Marnius. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and post that one too. It's kind of important to post 12 and 13 together. Um, hopefully that that will be obvious to whoever listens to this as to why that would be important that they would be close posted close together. Um, more noises. I got a fresh, brand spanking new fresh batch of crickets in. And so you're going to hear crickets like you never heard crickets before in this video, and I apologize ahead of time. Um, I listened to chapter 12 last night while I was driving. You know, by making these videos of the chapters and then listening to them, it's really helpful for me. I was listening to 12 last night, and um, I can really see how there needs more. I need to add more description to a lot of these chapters, these earlier chapters. I think the later chapters have more description, but the earlier chapters do not. And um, when they don't have enough description, they become talking head chapters. Dialogue. You don't really visualize. You can't really visualize what the characters are doing. And one thing that crossed my mind listening to Chapter 12 last night is, you know, you've got the main characters, you've got the central fire, and you've got the row of tents. But there's supposed to be a small army there, and so there should be other fires, and there should be other voices being heard in the distance, or whatever. The banter of the men, you know, the others, the sol the warriors, the other warriors, whatever. Or maybe a few of those warriors join Tarek and company around the main central fire. You know, so there needs to be more put into chapter 12 to flesh it out. And honestly, putting these chapters up the way they are and reading them, and then listening, it's like... There's, I can really, really, in my mind, pinpoint what needs, what the chapter still needs for it to be complete. Chapter 12 needs a lot more description. That's what I found listening to it. So anyway, it's an educational experience for me to really um, just hear it, hear it being read back. It's, it's really helping, I think, um, me make these chapters be better. Unfortunately for you, anybody listening to these, you're getting the rough draft version. <laughs> Hopefully some of these are better than others, but anyway, so here it is, chapter 13. Song of Mornius, chapter 13. Galen thrashed against furs, sticking to his throat and chest. Jerking awake, he opened his eyes, staring at the filtered gray light through the cracks in the tent flap. The sun wasn't up yet. From beyond the tent, he could hear the quiet nicker of the horses and ponies being fed, a soft crunching of snow as someone passed close by. With a sigh, Galen forced himself to relax. Visions had taken him from sleep on and off throughout the night. Visions of his stepfather slipping on his own blood on the floor of the little cabin, raising his arms to ward off the crimson blade of Galen's axe, coming at him again and again. The memory of the rage he had felt sent a shiver through Galen. Moaning, he pressed his face into the furs and squeezed his eyes tight, blocking out again the utter ruin he had made of Seth Laval. Again, he wended his way between Westermore's shops, a small village set deep in a valley just a few leagues away from Meredith. He passed carts with dun-colored ponies, red-faced merchants vending their wares, all around him village women crowded and pushed, their long woolen skirts heavy with melted snow. Mornius bumped a farmer's rigid shoulder, a man with roomy blue eyes, a deeply tanned weathered face. Mumbling an apology, Galen hurried by. I'm dreaming, he thought to himself, feeling again the furs against his chest. This is a dream. I've lived all this already. This dream was vivid, as clear as if he walked the streets of Westermore again. He knew just when he would stop to peer over the market. It was what he had done before, just a handful of days ago. The Snarltooth Mountains dominated the south horizon, as it did now his memories, glistening violet reflections of the sky on silver snow. Mornius's gem pulsed bright above his head. He groaned and rolled in his blankets. He remembered what it meant. It was a reaction to someone, something. Bodies pressed against him, blocking his view of the general store and livery. Places Tarek Florence said he might be after his attempt to recruit more men. Do you know what it is you carry? 
Galen turned. A man had jumped back, was jumping back, startled. Dressed in green robes, he huddled behind his arms. I mean no harm, he said, gasping. Were you talking to me? Galen dug into the pouch at his belt. Ignoring the curious glances from the people around him, he placed a shukna into the man's bruised hand. The stranger slapped the coin away, then reached out, his bony fingers yearning for the staff. I'm no beggar, he said. Not yet. But please, boy, let me touch it. Galen, bending down, snatched the shukna from the mud and dropped it into one of the man's immense pockets. The dark green fabric was stiff against his knuckles, encrusted by more than sweat and ale. Galen scowled as he straightened. He had lived with filth all his life. Do you need help? My staff can heal you, if that's what you're after. Help? The glittering gaze sharpened into focus. Nothing helps. Don't waste your power. My warder's dead at last. Nolan was too weak to recover despite my help. Your warder and his stone couldn't help him, boy. He certainly can't help me. My warder? Galen frowned. Here again was someone who knew more about his staff than he did. With narrowed eyes, he studied Morneus's blue gem. Mounted in steel talons, it snatched shards of violet from the afternoon sky. What do you mean? Are you a priest? Who is this Nolan? A red-faced boy, grinning beneath a thatch of blonde hair, lobbed a handful of snow at them both, then jumped back, squealing a laugh. Got ya! As the child ducked away, Galen turned to his cowering companion. He understood fear better than most. He knew what it was to be an outcast, to grow up isolated. Steady there, he told the stranger. It's just playing. The priest nodded and sucked in breath as he straightened himself. Morneus responded, bathing the priest with a soft blue fire. Flames of healing the man rejected with a flick of his robe. Catching at the staff, he glowered. Your warder lives, he said. I know it. He's the only one of them left. Nolan was his twin. He came to join Halrum in his battle with Malian, and so he too was brought here. People pressed in close, curious, a swirl of furs and colors and bodies warming the air between the tables. Galen eased his staff from the man's clenched fingers. Look he said. If we're going to survive, we've got to forget these warders helping us. Malian's the only warder I know of, and he's trying to kill us, so we fight him. Malian. The priest chewed his lower lip until it bled, scattering red drops across his beard. He bared his yellow teeth like a rock of hair. Warder of darkness, destroyer of light. He whispered the words through the fixed snarl on his face. Destroyer of Nolan! His eyes grew wide, white-rimmed. The Slayer of Sons! Yes, Malian! Galen's patience shattered. With an effort, he caught his breath, then exhaled. Call him whatever you want to. He killed the land to the south and west. We fight him so he won't kill the rest of the world. Lord Florn leads us. Fight? The priest blinked. Then his brown eyes narrowed. No mortal can fight that. Didn't you hear how Malian destroyed Nolan's temple? What he did to the city of Chelsea? Do you think you can do better? His gaze settled on the staff. Ah, but we do still have Horum. You're wrong. Galen pushed himself away from the man and struggled for control. He shrugged, hoping to hide his distress with a nonchalant gesture. We have nothing but ourselves. Only mortals can have any hope to do anything. Galen. A hand caught him above the elbow, gripped him, and pulled him back. Tarek Florence stepped between them, his hazel eyes reflecting the sun. Tarek, I... Farewell, Tarek snapped at the priest. You've outstayed your welcome here. Nolan's priest shrank back. I... Ask simply to touch his staff, please. Tarek smiled. Apparently you couldn't without upsetting my friend here. Did he offer you coin? Healing. Yes, my lord. The man rubbed his bloody lip. Crimson and dirt streaked his hand. Here. A note of empathy entered Tarek's voice. Take this. 
He handed the man the sack he had been carrying. Galen guessed by the crumbs scattered on the burlap cloth. The contents was loaves of bread. And this, Tarek added. And Galen saw his friend slip several more coins into the man's green pocket. If you still want to wait to fight what slew your warder, join us above the city. Get yourself a sword. Get some warmer clothing. Now go. Tarek finished. That was a lot of coin, Galen said, as the priest slipped back into the crowd. Do you think he'll join us? Tarek snorted. We'll never see him again. Tarek raised his voice above the growing chatter of the people pressing close. But never fear, he added. He'll likely pray for us. He paused. How about you, Galen? How was it with the Seeker Elves? I never got to ask you that the other day. Galen winced at the question. Looking down, he studied the gloved fingers Tarek had placed on his arm. You met with the elves, Tarek said. What did they say? Galen shivered. Again he felt a strange detachment, watching Tarek and himself from afar. The Seekers had reacted strongly to his staff, just as he feared they would. Melian wants me killed. Tarek nodded, his hazel eyes bright with sunlight. It won't happen. And the staff? Galen stared at his feet. They told me Hulrum sleeps in the staff. He paused. They asked me to stay. Galen closed his eyes, remembering the elves' quiet empathy. They think I've tasted enough violence, and you're wrong to lead me into this. Wrong, am I? Tarek studied his face. Do you agree? Galen shook his head, fighting to ignore the people passing by him, their bodies bumping into his, jostling him. No, he said. I already told you, my mother's dead because of me, and I want to make her sacrifice count. I'm worth nothing if I don't come with you. He broke off, staring at his companion. But you never said. Did you find us sleds? Tarek motioned him aside, away from the crowd. Did you trade the wagons? Galen asked. Tarek nodded. Together they tramped along the outskirts of the crowd, through a hand's width of slushy mud. We five sleds now for mountain travel, and grainers hired to tend the new ponies. My father was generous. His marker was high. The crowd thinned as they approached the town's east end. Ahead, the street narrowed, becoming again a familiar rutted path. A tough brown grass jutted between the grooves, appearing at random from the new snow and scattered debris. On this path the sleds awaited, each loaded with grain sacks and hay, foodstuffs for the warriors, tent gear and ropes. Five civilians stood by the sturdy dun ponies, watching their approach. Galen stopped as Tarek strode forward. He spoke a polite word to each grainer and shook each man's hand, introducing himself and listening for their names. A rider galloped toward them, a young man sitting tall astride a lathered gray colt, his black cloak lifted by the wind. Galen stiffened when he recognized the man's features, his sparsely grown beard and prominent chin. His forehead nodded in concentration as he controlled his leggy mount. Lieutenant Cavan Roth drew his horse to a leaping halt before them. Giants, he cried, giants are coming. Galen started at his words and the look of fear on his young face, turned to stare in the direction he had come. He heard the rapid scraping sound of Tarek's men around him drawing their swords. Galen shook his head. Somehow he had missed how the army came to be standing behind the sleds. Then from the trees exploded a single form, the lone figure of a young woman charging toward them, her great sword upraised, her face a grimace of fury, braids flying as she ran. Galen bolted upright in his furs. Breathing hard, he stared at the open doorway of the tent, at the bright sunlight beaming to land on the warm furs piled beside him. Just a dream, Galen, came Tarek's voice. Galen turned on his side to see Tarek sitting cross-legged close by, his face unreadable as he stared past him out the doorway, eyes raised to the new morning sun.